Hello, I'm Professor Akshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 35. In this lecture, we'll discuss the connection between force and momentum. This topic is covered in Chapter 9 of our textbook by Sirway and Drouet. We've been talking about momentum over the last few lectures, and the connection between momentum and velocity should be obvious to you. After all, momentum is defined as mass times velocity. But of course, velocity is related to acceleration and acceleration is related to force. So it shouldn't be any surprise that momentum and force are related. The exact relationship between them is this equation here. The rate of change in momentum with respect to time is equal to the net external force acting on the system. So whenever a system is under a net external force, its momentum is going to change and this equation tells us precisely how much or how that momentum is going to change. This relationship is quite important and so it's worth our time proving it. The proof proceeds as follows. We begin with the derivative of momentum with respect to time. We know that momentum is mass times velocity. We know that mass is constant at least for the situations we consider in this class so we can bring the mass outside of the derivative and we end up with the derivative of v with respect to t. This derivative, of course, is equal to the acceleration of the system, so we can write this as mass times acceleration. Now, thanks to Newton's second law of motion, we know that mass times the acceleration is equal to the net force acting on the system. Now, the net force acting on the system could consist of many different forces. Some of them might be external, coming from other parts outside of the system and then many of them might be internal consisting of one component of the system pushing or pulling on another component of the system so generally we can divide the sum of all forces into the sum of all external forces plus the sum of all internal forces of course by Newton's third law of motion for every force there is an equal but opposite force a reaction and so the sum of all the internal forces will cancel each other out. In other words, the force of A on B will be canceled by the force of B on A. The external forces will not cancel in the same manner because the source of an external force is outside of the system. And so what we are left with is the sum of the external forces which proves our initial assertion. If you add all of the external forces on a system, what you get is the rate of change in momentum. Recall the principle of momentum conservation. It's stated that if the sum of the external forces is equal to zero, then P initial is equal to P final. Originally, when we presented this statement, we did not prove it. We simply took it as a principle but now you can see where it comes from. The proof of the principle of momentum conservation essentially follows from this equation near the top. As you can see, if the sum of the external forces is zero, then dp dt will be zero. When the derivative of a function is equal to zero, a graph of that function with respect to time will be a flat level graph indicating that that function is not changing. So momentum is not changing, momentum is constant, and therefore the initial momentum must equal to the final momentum. Let's use the relationship between force and momentum in a practice problem. A tennis ball with a mass of 0.15 kilograms traveling horizontally with initial speed of 4 meters per second bounces off a wall with a final speed of 3.5 meters per second. The collision lasts 0.1 seconds. What is the average force that the wall exerts on the tennis ball? So we have a tennis ball that initially is moving with velocity vi towards a wall, and then it bounces, it changes its velocity. The final velocity vector is pointing in a different direction, and it has a different magnitude. The initial velocity vector has a magnitude of four. Remember, that's what speed means. And the final velocity vector has a magnitude of 3.5. Since the velocity vector is clearly changing, there must be an acceleration. The tennis ball must be accelerating, and if it is accelerating, there must be a force that's causing this acceleration. 
the force that's causing the tennis ball to accelerate, to change its velocity, is the force of wall on the tennis ball. We can think of this force as a normal force, but for now we'll just refer to it as the force of wall on the ball. Note also that we're not really interested in what the tennis ball is doing far from the wall. We're really interested in the tennis ball when it's really close to the wall, from a moment before collision to a very short moment after collision. We want to use the relationship between force and momentum to calculate the force that must be acting on the tennis ball. Now, before dealing with momentum, remind yourself that momentum is a vector quantity, and therefore you must be very careful in dealing with it. You must consider its x and y components separately, and whenever you consider its components, you need to pay attention to whether those components are positive or negative. To help us prepare for that, let's write down the initial velocity and the final velocity of the ball. The initial velocity can be expressed as 4, 0. That should be simple enough. The final velocity should be expressed as minus 3.5 comma zero. The problem gives us the magnitude as 3.5, but we must put a minus sign in front of it in recognition of the fact that the ball has bounced off the wall and is going in the opposite direction. The ball cannot bounce if it does not change its direction of motion. So if you wrote 3.5 comma zero, then in effect you would be saying that the tennis ball simply went through the wall and of course that would not be realistic. Now that we have the velocity we can calculate the force. Recall that force and momentum are related. Here we're going to focus on the x component of the motion since the tennis ball is moving horizontally. The sum of the forces in the x direction is simply the force that we're interested in, the force of wall on ball or the normal force. There are other forces acting on the tennis ball, for example, the weight of the tennis ball, the force of gravity is acting on it, but that's in the y direction. For now, we're not interested in that force. We know that the sum of the external forces must equal to the derivative of momentum with respect to time. If we're talking about forces in the x direction, then it should be the derivative of the x momentum. Now the derivative of momentum with respect to time gives us the instantaneous force. For now we're interested in the average force. The average force is the force that acts during the entire period of collision and that is delta P over delta T. Of course these two expressions are related. The derivative of P with respect to T is simply the limit of this fraction as delta T goes to zero. So these two uh, expressions are related, we're replacing the derivative with a delta P over delta T simply because we're interested in the average force. Delta P of course means the change in momentum, so we have P final minus P initial, and we know that momentum is simply mass times velocity. The mass of the tennis ball does not change from one moment to the next, so it's the same mass, we can factor that out, and now we have V final minus V initial. V final, of course, is minus 3.5. V initial, of course, is 4. So what we have is minus 3.5 minus 4 times the mass of the tennis ball divided by the period of collision. This is the amount of time during which the tennis ball is actually in contact with the wall. And when we place all this into our calculator, we find that the force of wall on the ball is minus 11.25 newtons. It should make sense that the force is a negative force indicating that the wall must be pushing to the left on the tennis ball in order to make it bounce. Let's finish this lecture with another practice problem. A car moving at 10 meters per second crashes into a large tree. The car comes to a complete stop while the tree does not move. A passenger who's wearing a seatbelt comes to a stop in 0.26 seconds. Calculate the average force the seatbelt exerts on the passenger to bring him to a stop. The passenger's mass is 70 kilograms. So we're going to once again use the relationship between force and momentum to calculate the force. We're going to remind ourselves that momentum is a vector quantity, so we must consider its x and y components separately. 
And we're also going to remind ourselves that each one of those components can be positive or negative, so we're going to pay careful attention to the signs. We'll start by writing down the velocity of the passenger. Since we're interested in the force on the passenger, we're interested in the velocity and eventually the momentum of the passenger. The passenger's initial velocity is 10 comma zero. That's because we're told the car is initially moving at 10 meters per second. So we assume that the passenger and everything else in the car is initially moving at 10 meters per second. We're also assuming that the car is moving on a level horizontal surface so that there is no velocity in the y direction. Hence, the passenger's velocity initially is 10 comma zero. His final velocity is going to be zero comma zero because we assume that the car, the passenger, and everything else in the car are eventually going to come to a full stop after the collision. We know that the net force acting on a system is equal to the derivative of the momentum of the system with respect to time. We're going to focus on the x direction because all of the motion in this problem is in the x direction. The net force in the x direction is simply the force of the seat belt on the passenger. This is exactly what we want to calculate. There are other forces acting on the passenger, such as weight and the normal force, but those forces act in the y direction. We would uh, include those in a different set of equations if we were interested in analyzing the y motion. So we find that the force of the seat belt on passenger must equal to the derivative of the passenger's momentum in the x direction with respect to time. This derivative gives us the instantaneous force for this particular problem. We're interested in the average force. So we're going to replace dp dt with delta p delta t. Remember that this derivative is simply equal to delta p divided by delta t in the limit as delta t becomes very small, in the limit as the denominator approaches zero. So if we're interested in the average force, it's very appropriate to replace the derivative with delta p over delta t. Delta p, of course, is the change in momentum, so we have p final minus p initial. The mass of the passenger is 70 kilograms. Remember, we're interested in the force on the passenger, so we should be talking about the momentum of the passenger, and therefore the mass of the passenger. The velocity of the passenger finally is zero, and initially it's 10. We're interested in the difference between those. Putting all this into our calculator, remembering that the stopping time is 0.26 seconds, we find that the force necessary to stop the passenger is minus 2,692.3 newtons. This is the force that the seatbelt exerts on the passenger. It's negative because the car is moving in the positive direction, the passenger is moving in the positive direction, and if we want to stop the passenger, we need to exert a force in the opposite direction, in the negative x direction. Incidentally, this calculation suggests a way of making the collision safer for the passenger. It suggests a way to reduce this force. We can reduce this force by increasing the stopping time. If the stopping time is increased to 0.3 seconds or 0.5 seconds, then the force that acts on the passenger and might eventually hurt the passenger can be reduced. One way to increase the stopping time is to replace the seat belt with airbags. Airbags have more cushioning, they're softer, they have more give in the event of a collision, and therefore it takes longer to stop the passenger using an airbag but that's exactly the advantage of an airbag. It reduces the force that acts on the passenger. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.